Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, tonight's presentation, Identification of Common Tree Problems, is the third webinar in our urban forestry series titled Urban Trees in Your Backyard. Um, more information about the upcoming webinars in this series can be found on our website at ccenassau.org. Um, any questions you have throughout the presentation, you can submit through the chat or the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. Um, there will be ISA CEU credits provided for tonight's webinar. If you would like to receive credit for your attendance, at the end of the webinar, you can provide your full name and your ISA certification number into the chat function. Support for tonight's webinars comes from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation through their Urban and Community Forestry Program. Any questions um, after the presentation can be sent to our email at ccenassau.org. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, nassau at cornell.edu. All right, Vinny, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to our Monday night um, chat about trees. Uh, tonight, I'm going to cover, I'm going to give you a whirlwind tour of um, some of the problems that trees have. Um, some of the problems I've chosen to talk about are, you know, some of the more common ones that I uh, come across um, or have over the years. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on a little bit on diagnosing tree problems and um, resources to help help you do that if you wanted to, you know, do it yourself. But you don't have to go it alone. You know, um, part of the services that we pro provide at Cornell Cooperative Extension is um, diagnostics, and that, that means uh, figuring out what the problems are with with your plants, whether it's uh, a garden plant, a flower, uh, annuals, perennials, vegetables, trees, shrubs, um, you know, we cover the whole gamut. So um, we, we do provide that service. Um, I am uh, going to um, advance the slide and we'll, we'll get going. Um, please, uh, I don't know if Michael mentioned it, but uh, please hold off your questions until the end. I'm going to try to give us um, some some time at the end to uh, ask some questions through the the uh, Q and A, and um, so let's get started. So. so, what's wrong with my tree? That's a question I get uh, all the time at the office. Um, and um, so tonight we're just going to focus on tree problems. Uh, this particular photo has um, one of the common tree tree problems. It's called shot hole disease. It's on cherries, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But I know um, some of you may uh, have this on your cherry trees. The ornamental cherries get it. All the uh, fruit bearing cherries get it, and some of the shrub uh, cherries get it, um, like the uh, cherry laurels. So. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So diagnosing tree problems is a, is a process. Um, when a, a specimen comes in or I get photos or um, I'm uh, on site, um, I, I kind of go through this process. Um, the goal is to narrow down the possibilities. It may seem overwhelming, especially if you're new to this, how, you know, just how do you figure it out? I'm going to um, give you some tips on um, how we do that. Um, and what our goal is, we really want to um, identify the cause. Um, you know, we, we don't want to treat sim a symptom um, just, just like with our own health. We want to really find out what's causing the problem and address that. Um, we use what's available. Uh, we use observation. We use uh, facts. We ask a lot of questions. So it's um, we're really um, kind of like playing Sherlock Holmes. You know, we're looking for clues. Um, once we figure out what it is that's causing the problem, then we determine. Then we can make a, a good decision on uh, what kind of a control option to use or even if a control option um, is needed. 
um, a lot of times I'll identify the cause a, of a particular symptom that's uh, happening, something that maybe is uh, never been seen before on the tree or never did that before. And uh, sometimes um, it does require taking action, but sometimes um, it may not. Um, it may be something that's too late to treat, or it may be something that happens because of a particular weather condition where all the factors come together uh, in a particular season. You know, the perfect storm happens um, and it might not happen again in the future. So we, we kind of look at uh, all the possibilities and then we, uh, we choose, you know, the best option um, that's suited for the situation at hand. So, um, you know, there's sort of a lot of judgment going on, but it's all based on uh, observation and facts and identifying the cause and, uh, you know, whether something needs to be done or not. So, you know, move on. So some of the things, you know, looking for clues um, is really the goal in the diagnostic uh, process to get to, get to the, um, you know, the goal of finding the cause. So it's sort of a, it's, well, it is a step um, process. Um, these are the uh, steps that we typically would take. Um, one of the most important things is to know what tree you have or what plant you have. Um, identify the tree. Um, having the common name is very helpful. Um, having um, the scientific name, if possible, is even more helpful because when you start asking others for help with this, um, like myself or other professionals, or if you're looking up, trying to use some of the resources and you're looking up um, diseases or insects or, you know, common tree problems, um, knowing the name of the tree is going to be critical for narrowing down all the possibilities out there, you know, so it is important. And I know that can be tough for some folks, but, um, you know, again, um, there are resources out there. There's uh, people out there that can help as experts. So you don't have to go it alone. Know what's normal for your particular tree to determine if it is a problem or if it's a real problem. Um, just because something is there or um, you find a bug or, you know, a particular, you know, maybe a spot or something or the tree is doing something. Um, it may not, you know, it may be a problem. It may not, it may not really be something that we need to worry about. Um, check for symptoms, uh, compare normal to what's happening. Um, symptoms are um, what a particular problem or cause is doing to the tree or the plant. So it might be something like um, the plant's just not putting out as much growth as it used to it. Maybe it's not blooming as much, or maybe it's thinning out, not as many leaves, or um, maybe there's uh, the leaves are off color. Those are all symptoms. Um, we really have to get underneath that and find out what's causing those symptoms. But the symptoms will get you to finding out what the cause is. Look for signs, evidence of a cause. Uh, signs would be things like um, if you had a tree and, and there was um, a hole at the base of it and there was a sawdust like material coming out, that would be a sign that perhaps carpenter ants were at work. You know, this, um, they don't actually eat the wood. They will sort of um, chop the wood up and you know, kind of deposit it outside the tree to create a cavity, a living space for themselves. Um, so, you know, um, you may even find um, maybe um, a certain pattern to the holes in the leaves, or maybe maybe it's um, just notches at the edge of the leaf, or, you know, it, it's something that a pest might be doing, or 
uh, there might be bumps on the leaves or there might be um, an odd growth. You know, those are all signs um, that lead you uh, to determining what the cause of that weird thing that's going on on your tree is all about. Well, I ask a lot of questions. You should be asking questions too, but if it's your tree, you might want to ask yourself or ask others that are doing things um, around the tree or to the tree um, with trees, because some of them are quite large. They, you know, trees are impacted by what is going on, not only on your property, but um, it may be what your neighbor's doing as well. So you may have to, you know, peek over the fence and maybe ask the neighbor, you know, what, what might be going on, or maybe make an observation of what might be going on. So, you know, are they applying herbicides? And, you know, is there a connection to what, you know, strange thing is happening to your tree? You know, those kinds of uh, questions. So uh, it's not always easy to tell what the cause of a problem is, but asking questions um, helps get you closer to figuring out what's really going on in a situation. Like I said, you know, what's been happening around or near the tree lately, um, you know, these problems don't, you know, necessarily respect the um, boundaries of property lines and such. And, you know, what, you know, even what's the weather been like? What are we experiencing um, lately? You know, was it a, a dry summer? Was it, you um, was it a very wet, rainy summer, or um, maybe you know something else is going on? Did we have a, a freeze, or um, was is there construction going on? Is there a new deck and pool being put in, and uh, maybe impacting the root system of that tree? So um, it pays to ask. Well, you know, ask around. Um, again, you really have to put on your um, detective. Uh, hat and get your spyglass out and really, um, you know, look for the clues. And like I said, you don't have to go it alone. Um, get help if you need it. Um, there are resources and I'm going to share some of the resources that um, I use and recommend that you can be using. Um, there are experts around, like I said, the, you know, at Cooperative Extension. Uh, we're there to help you. There's uh, every county has a uh, cooperative extension. Typically, um, you know, we're out of Nassau County. Um, Suffolk County has a great Co Cornell cooperative extension uh, program as well. We actually have the Long Cornell um, University Long Island um, Horticulture Research and Education Center out in Riverhead. So we, uh, you know, we're pretty close to some of the uh, the real experts out there, some of the top scientists, you know, in the in the country or in the world, um, doing research out at the lab in Riverhead, um, that are um, focused on things like entomology, plant pathology, weed science, so on and so forth. So we have them at our fingertips as well. And um, Cornell has lots of labs uh, for testing. We do have the entomology lab in Ithaca at the uh, university. We have a, a, a plant disease diagnostic lab that does um, disease um, analysis on samples that you can send them. You can send them photos as well. Both labs will a lot of times look at photos. Um, there, are, there are some small fees for that, but it, it's, it really gets you um, into a, a whole nother level of uh, diagnosing a tree problem. So uh, you don't have to go it alone. I'm gonna share some other resources with you as well. And then uh, the whole goal again is to, you know, get to uh, what the cause of the problem is, the final diagnosis, and then make some choices, some decisions on uh, how to go forward with um, treating the problem. So these are uh, some of the more uh, common uh, publications that I use. I'm always um, in these two books. These are uh, Cornell publications. On the left is the, uh, the insects that feed on trees and shrubs. And um, these are pretty big, heavy books, uh, hundreds of pages. Um, uh, on, the, on the right is the um, diseases of trees and shrubs. Um, they're 
you know, once you uh, know about them and start using them, they're pretty easy to use. But I will say that you do need to know the names of the trees. Um, and with these books, it really helps uh, if you know the scientific name. So, but that shouldn't, um, you know, stop you. Um, again, I, you know, we can help at Cooperative Extension on identifying the trees. And I have uh, copies of these books at the office. So this is uh, some of the resources that I use uh, in conjunction with those two publications. Um, I also depend on these two publications. Um, this is from the Cornell Cooperative Extension um, Pest Management Education Program. That's what PMEP stands for, Pest Management Education Program. Um, these are the pest management guides. These are um, available for, as a publication for purchase from the Cornell Bookstore. Um, the publication on the left is the one um, most commonly used or actually uh, contains the recommendations for um, homeowners. Um, in it, you will find um, each of the uh, plants listed there and then um, the most common problems that they may suffer from. So once you know the name of the tree or the shrub, or this actually covers annuals, perennials, uh, lawn problems. So there's a whole, in, in fact, it even covers um, home pests as well. But uh, when it comes to trees, you look up the tree and it'll list there typically um, maybe two to six different problems that is common for that particular tree and the um, what to do about it, the controls for it. And all of the, um, if there is a pesticide that needs to be um, used to you know, uh, control the problem, um, this particular publication on the left lists things that are available to homeowners in garden centers, um, big box stores, hardware stores. So you can, um, you know, do it yourself. You can buy these pesticides in, in formulations that are for use by homeowners. The publication on the right is um, for uh, professionals. Um, it's uh, more uh, for uh, pes commercial pesticide applicators. It contains the recommendations similar to uh, what the publication on the left, it's, um, um, the recommendations are listed by the, the tree species and then um, it's a, divided up a little bit different, but you'll find the uh, insects, the most common insects and disease problems and what to use. Uh, the commercial formulations, however, um, are a little more difficult for homeowners to purchase. Some of them may be restricted. You may need to use, you may need to have a commercial pesticide applicator's license to purchase them, or you may be able to buy them, but they're in formulations that are really geared to professionals. So, um, you know, these uh, products are, you know, meant for making up maybe hundreds or, of gallons of um, a spray or for, they may be in packaging that, you know, is for covering, you know, tens of thousands of uh, square feet or maybe even acres. So it makes it difficult for a homeowner to really, really utilize the one on the right. But any one that you hire for um, controlling pests on your property is required to have a license and they have the um, option or the, um, um, all of these recommendations at their fingertips to use. So it's not maybe that it's better or anything like that. It's just different. So, um, but both of these publications are available at the Cornell bookstore as well. And I'll share the information on how to, how to get to the bookstore online. And then lately I've been playing around with these, um, these new apps, phone apps for your phone. Uh, this is one in particular that I've been playing with for the last few months. I don't use it on a daily basis, but I think it's pretty good. It's the uh, Purdue, Purdue University uh, um, Tree Doctor app. Um, you know, uh, uh, these things are new, they're, they're, they're being developed. I think, you know, this one in particular, I like. There's also one for shrubs um, and there's others out there. Um, uh, this is, you know, pretty, pretty good. You know, it's, it's professional level, but I think that any, 
any homeowner could uh, easily uh, utilize this. And they, it's real, you know, this is the, uh, how you get started on the right here. So uh, you just um, kind of pick out what type of tree it is, or you, if you know the name, you can just go, you know, right there. And it covers common diseases, common insects, and other problems that um, trees suffer from. It's, it's quite good. So check it out. It's, um, this, is, this one is free. Um, some of the apps out there, there's a charge for. I would be, um, I'm always wary of those, but um, I don't know, maybe I'm just old fashioned and I, I'm comfortable with the, uh, with the publications, but you know, check it out. You know, they have lots of photos and so no recommendations in it as far as pesticide use. So you may still have to get into some of those publications or um, I can help you with that at Cooperative Extension with finding the products as well. And these are some of the online resources that I, um, you know, frequently use. And, um, you know, this, this uh, um, presentation is gonna be posted on um, our website as a video or um, so you can refer to it um, later on. Um, but these connect you to some of the labs there's actually a, Cornell has a troubleshooting page, and um, I find that there's a lot um, on this one particular page that can almost uh, help you solve any problem you might come across in the garden. I don't know if I can pull this up right now. But maybe not. Maybe there's too much going on here. Oh, there we go. Okay, here it is. Troubleshooting. Um, I find that people are always amazed at what they can find on this one particular web page as, as far as finding resources. They're all, all the Cornell resources are listed here. So. And that publication that I showed you a couple of slides ago, the um, pest management around the home is actually posted here and you could actually access it online. So, you know, here's the uh, tree and shrub management pages. So you don't even have to, you know, purchase the uh, hard copy of it. You can um, look at it here. So anyways, let's move on. All right, um, there's lots of tree problems out there. I can't possibly cover them all in less than an hour, but um, I do have a lot of them listed here. Um, before we get started in um, looking over those lists, um, I just wanted to explain that um, there's sort of um, two categories, two general categories of problems, biotic versus abiotic. Biotic means that it's, um, the cause is by a living organism, you know, it's biological, but there's a lot of common tree problems that are abiotic or they're not caused by a living entity or organism. So I'm thinking about, you know, um, something like when a tree gets hit by lightning or a tree is um, in soggy wet soil all the time, you know, that um, can kill a tree, uh, creates low oxygen levels and rots the roots or causes the roots to rot. Other organisms do get in there, but the abiotic disorder is caused by a non-living entity. So um, we're gonna cover uh, both um, or introduce you to both. Um, the first uh, is insects and mites that we're gonna cover and they're definitely living organisms. So they're biotic uh, tree problems. Uh, we're going to cover diseases, which uh, are comprised of generally uh, fungal or bacterial 
um, or even viruses. Um, they're all classified as diseases. And then there's this category called other, which um, is actually uh, contains both um, biological, biotic, and abiotic um, causes. So we'll move on. So I just have a list here of um, some of the more common problems. And, and by no means is this a complete list. There's hundreds more than this, but these are some of the more common ones that um, I see every year um, in the office and in my previous life in the world of um, nurseries and uh, working for garden centers. So um, these are some of the more common pest problems. And we're gonna touch upon some of these individual um, insects and uh, mites as well in a few minutes. Um, diseases. Um, again, these are, it's just a small sampling of some of the more common problems that are out and about um, happening to trees out there. And like I said, by no means uh, is this all of them. Um, in fact, uh, there's hundreds, there's hundreds more, but these are some of the more common ones. This is a diseases continued. Um, you may recognize some of the insects or diseases perhaps, and some maybe not. And then there's the other category, which includes a vast array of different causes of problems for trees, um, animals, uh, wildlife damage, um, problems from a lack of water like drought to too much water like floods, um, temperatures like freezes, frost um, that can injure plants if they happen at a particularly certain time. Um, trees are often damaged by herbicides or insecticides that you know weren't intentionally applied to harm the tree, but um, things go wrong sometimes, mistakes get made. And uh, again, like I said, what happens uh, on the neighbor's property may indeed impact the trees on your property. You know, for instance, with a weed killer, an herbicide, um, the intended target may be um, a dandelion in the lawn. But if the conditions are such that there's a lot of wind and it's, um, you know, a fine spray that's being applied. It can get, you know, lifted up onto the leaves of the tree and it can make for some weird, wacky, you know, things that happen on the trees. So, um, you know, you have to, you know, again, you have to um, ask questions and you have to, um, you know, cast a broad net out there to figure out what's been happening around that tree. Um, even things like, uh, you know, ice, snow, lightning, trees do, do get hit by lightning and then uh, you don't realize it, but maybe um, could be uh, days or weeks or even months later, you know, um, something strange is happening to the tree. Um, nutrient deficiencies happen all the time out there. And, um, they may be caused by neglect or they may be caused by an overzealous gardener that may be putting down some stuff, uh, not to go into detail right now, that um, can have a negative effect on the availability of nutrients. You may have the nutrient in the soil, but because um, the chemistry is changed by something that's happening, um, the nutrients are not available. So, and then we have people problems, you know, mowers uh, and weed whackers injuring tree trunks. And we can have salt damage from, you know, storms, uh, from de-icing materials, uh, from uh, salt water flooding, uh, from uh, road salt being kicked up into the air in a soupy, you know, when it gets wet out and uh, cars are driving by and the wind blows, you have uh, salt being picked up by the uh, wind and being blown onto the trees and shrubs in the area and causing damage. 
Um, and then we have some seasonal grounding that occurs uh, that often um, is brought into me that, um, you know, is really normal, but it shocks people to see it. Sometimes um, folks are not always aware that um, even evergreens or some certain conifers and um, lose their leaves every year or evergreens uh, don't actually keep their leaves forever and ever. And uh, so they have a seasonal shedding, just like the deciduous trees drop their year, uh, leaves every year. Um, there are some trees that um, seem like they're not supposed to be doing that, but they do it. And I'll, uh, we'll get into a little bit of that later. Uh, problems with the sun. Yeah, sometimes it could be too uh, sunny or you can get wind burn in the winter from the sun and the wind that dehydrates the leaves. So, you know, these, these things are, you know, they're all prop tree problems and they're common occurrences. So we're going to get into, uh, I just picked out a few uh, of each category to go over um, just to kind of introduce you to some of the, you know, common problems that are going on with trees out there. So we're going to start with insects and mites. Uh, when I think of uh, insects, the, you know, for me, one of the more interesting insects are aphids. Um, aphids are probably the most common pest out there in the world of plants, uh, gardening. Uh, aphids um, are these tiny little sap sucking um, insects. Uh, I find them fascinating. <laughs> But they really, uh, they can really harm a plant. So uh, there's a little aphid up there on the left, in the left-hand corner, staring us down. Um, here are aphids feeding on the underside of uh, a tree leaf. I forget what tree that is, but it's not important. Um, sometimes you don't know you have aphids because um, you're all, you're not looking on the undersides of the leaves. You're sometimes only looking on the top of the leaves. But when it comes to looking for pest problems, you need to look on all. Uh, parts of the plant, the top and the bottom of the leaves, because that's where they like to hide. Uh, the interest, one of the interesting things, and there's many about aphids, is that they come in a lot of different colors. Um, they come in yellow, green, red. Uh, we've got black ones here on a stem. Um, so um, they um, also can reproduce quite uh, prolifically. Um, they can lay eggs. Um, they can bear live young as well. At the bottom right hand corner here is an aphid that is um, um, shooting out babies, um, basically. Um, it depends on the, you know, again, I'm, I can't get into any uh, great detail, but um, if food source is plentiful, um, through hormonal reactions, it'll cause the aphid population to start bearing live young. Um, when food sources start to dwindle, um, and if you notice here, this, this aphid doesn't have wings, neither does this one, but when food sources become um, depleted, um, aphids will often uh, start to push out generations of young that have wings, and those um, uh, winged uh, individuals will fly to another source of food, uh, and they may even um, uh, start laying eggs. Um, uh, they may need to mate. Um, that will preserve the genetic diversity of uh, populations. So there are a lot of these reasons, and I, I won't get into it here, but uh, they're very prolific. Um, that's the, a survival tactic that they have. Um, they are probably the favorite food of a lot of the beneficial insects like ladybugs and lace, lace wings and um, uh, praying mantises. They're, they're easy picking, so that's why they produce so many young so quickly. Um, you know, sometimes I, uh, I walk by a tree one day and it's got nothing on it and the next day it's loaded with aphids. You know, it's almost like it's overnight. There's some telltale signs because they're sap sucking insects, they have piercing and sucking mouth parts, as you can see here on this um, aphid here. It's like a hypodermic needle. They just basically plunge that into a leaf and they start sucking the sap. They feed so prolifically, they don't always uh, process all the sugars that are in the sap. That in their excrement uh, drops to the leaf below it, making the, everything sticky. 
uh, below it. So that's a telltale sign that you have aphids. Um, another telltale sign may be that on this sticky substance that is called um, um, honeydew, um, to make it um, sound nicer, um, oftentimes a, um, a mold will grow on it or a fungus and it's called black sooty mold. So if you're getting this black substance forming on everything below your trees, um, this is also the substance that makes the you know, windshield and the finish on your car sticky or form this black sooty mold. Look up, it's probably aphids or uh, some other sap sucking insect that's feeding on the trees below, uh, above. So let's move on. Adelgids um, related, they're related. Uh, they're like cousins to the aphids. Um, they're very tiny. Um, one of the, um, tell these little white sacks here on the hemlock, hemlock will indulge it here, but there are many different types of adelgids. Um, are, these are egg sacs. There's about a hundred eggs inside each of these sacs uh, on the hemlock will adelgid, the pine bark adelgid as well. Um, these hatch into small crawlers, which you see here down below. Um, they go through several um, instars, and this is an adult adelgid that's, um, again, they're sap sucking insects. So this one's feeding on the underside of a needle of a hemlock. Again, um, this particular species, the pine bark adelgid, does tend to gravitate towards uh, thin bark um, evergreens like um, pines. Um, and uh, so, you know, their main job is to suck the sap out of the trees and the damage that they do is they weaken um, these trees. They make them susceptible to other pest problems or disease problems. Um, so they slowly decline if they're left alone. Um, and then other diseases and insects start to um, attack these trees. And um, so these uh, trees uh, eventually, if nothing is done, they um, slowly decline and uh, eventually die from either um, being overwhelmed by these um, pests or um, other problems that, you know, um, these trees attract due to the fact that they're not in a state of good health. So, switching over to some other insects. Um, these are insects that are pretty common on birch trees. Um, it, um, the uh, gray birch, the uh, European gray birch, and the um, paper birch. Um, there are birch varieties that don't tend to get these um, either at all or as much like the river birch, but the white barked birch trees tend to get these pest problems. On the left is bronze birch borer. It's a um, it's a small um, insect that um, it, its larva lives uh, under the bark of the tree. Here's uh, on the bottom left hand corner of it is the larva, a little borer insect. Um, when it reaches a certain stage of its development, it will eat its way out and create a hole. And here's a, uh, on the, bo in the bottom is a hole with a dime next to it. You can see uh, how small the hole is. The holes are uh, uh, the shape of the letter capital D. So it's round, but then it's on one side and then it's uh, sort of semi-rounded on the other side. And this is the adult on the left. It's a, um, um, again, the, uh, it's a sap, it's a, it destroys the um, conductive tissue under the bark. It um, sort of, uh, um, shut off the flow of sap, uh, nutrients uh, under the bark of a tree, and it can weaken the tree. Telltale sign um, or symptoms actually is a decline in the overall um, health and vigor of the tree, um, leading to the total collapse of the tree. So um, on the right side is a uh, birch leaf miner. Um, these actually live within the leaves of the birch. Uh, this is the adult in the middle here. Um, they, they live between the upper and lower leaf surface of the leaf. You can see a patch here and uh, you can barely make out the larva here. And 
bottom right hand corner is a picture of two small um, larva below. This is actually um, in the fly family. The uh, bronze birch borer is a uh, beetle. Um, but uh, two problems that are pretty common on the, uh, um, on the birch trees in our area. A co another common problem are uh, caterpillars. Um, and caterpillars are, um, they can be, they can feed in the spring or um, the summer or even the fall. This happens to be gypsy moth. They uh, appear in the, in the spring, um, just after the leaves form on trees, typically uh, in our area, oaks are probably the most susceptible to gypsy moths. Um, on the bottom right hand corner here are adult um, female moths laying eggs. This is the eggs um, sac or um, deposits inside these, uh, what look like little patches of mud are hundreds of eggs. Uh, the eggs hatch in the spring when there's something to eat. In the upper right hand corner is um, some smaller newly hatched, um, actually this is a newly hatched um, gypsy moth caterpillar. Uh, the damage that they do is they totally eat the leaves, uh, a lot of times defoliating the trees, like on the left here, uh, quite devastating. And um, it, it oftentimes doesn't kill the trees. Um, usually the uh, oaks and a lot of the deciduous trees can put out a second flush of leaves. Uh, however, it takes a lot of energy to do that. So if the gypsy moth is a problem for a few years in a row, it could significantly weaken um, the population of deciduous trees that these uh, are feeding on and uh, render them uh, weak and um, maybe susceptible to some other problems. Um, there are some natural um, controls that have sort of come into the area, some biological controls. Uh, I know there's a fungus. Um, if the um, weather is just right and we have rain during the time when these smaller um, Caterpillars are out on the leaves. Um, this fungus um, will uh, attack them. It's a disease of the caterpillar and, re you know, render them uh, dead. Um, but that, you know, always, can't always be counted upon. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, pesticides, um, chemical and um, biological or, um, um, you know, safer methods. There's also some other strategies for controlling it. Um, the caterpillar on the right here, um, as it grows, it sheds its skin, and this is the um, shed skin. So it um, recently uh, emerged from its old um, skin and left it behind and um, is continuing on to feed another day and continue growing. Uh, bottom left-hand corner are the adult gypsy moth. The uh, darker colored moth is the male and the white uh, is the female. They're um, obviously mating here. Um, so it's, it can be pretty devastating, but it runs in cycles. Um, so s some areas we see it quite um, extensively, and then it seems to just disappear. Um, back in the uh, years ago, in the 70s and 80s, it was much more prevalent than it is today, but that's because um, of these new biological controls or natural controls that have sort of, I guess, taken a foothold in our uh, ecosystems. And we've got um, some other caterpillars, Eastern Kent caterpillar on the left and fall webworm on the right. They look like gypsy moth caterpillars, but one of the differences is they make these uh, webs in the branches of the tree. Eastern Kent caterpillar is more common in the spring and the um, fall webworm is uh, something we see in late summer and fall. All kinds of scales that are common problems on trees. Um, these are just some of them. Uh, Lucanium scale, um, they're sap suckers. All of these, there's a little in insect underneath these bumps. Um, they're sort of like what a turtle would be, have a protective shell, but the soft parts of the animal are underneath. Um, 
These uh, cottony maple leaf scales are in their females and they're in the egg laying stage. So again, in this white material, there's hundreds of eggs. Oyster shell scale is up here on the right. Um, these are the adults. Um, these are the small um, crawlers that hatched uh, out of the eggs that were laid underneath the uh, females that were left behind here from the previous season. Um, and there's all kinds of scales, uh, even ones that uh, appear on uh, pine needles. So, And there's many different types of borers out, th out here. One of the mo more common one that we seem to be seeing more often is on the left here, the two-line chestnut borer. We don't have a lot of chestnut trees around, but we do uh, have a lot of oak trees, which tend to be um, one of the favorite alternative hosts of the uh, two-line chestnut border, borer. Uh, again, it's a, um, it gets under the bark. It makes these serpentine um, chambers or trails underneath the bark. That cuts off the flow of sap. Um, here's, a, here's a borer on the left here, and then this is what the adult looks like. Um, this is another borer um, that's uh, becoming more and more common on our ash trees, emerald ash borer. We, we do have more and more of them lately. And um, this is the adult on the, on the top. They do damage to the leaves, but they can render a tree dead pretty quickly within a season or two. Um, and um, a lot of times um, woodpeckers will start stripping the bark off of the ash tree to get to these uh, um, little borers. You know, they do make these serpentine trails underneath there. So sometimes the uh, woodpecker activity can clue you in as to what's going on. And then there's a number of bark beetles. Um, these two beetles here happen to be one of the more common ones that I see. On the left is the um, southern pine beetle, which um, has a particular appetite for feeding on the uh, pitch pines in our area or you know, in the pine barrens out east. Um, black turpentine beetle is common. This is the adult black turpentine beetle. They can um, knock out a tree pretty quickly. This is a, uh, a pine tree uh, that was devastated by it in a very short period of time. Again, they do damage under the bark. Uh, one of the telltale signs is this pitch or this sap that's pushed out in a response to the um, beetles feeding under the bark of the tree. They, the tree actually tries to push the beetles out um, if the resources like water is abundant, rainfall is abundant. So that's a telltale sign that you've got um, bark beetles on this particular species. But there's many other types of bark beetles. Uh, many of them do uh, affect uh, deciduous trees as well. And spider mites, uh, they're very tiny, uh, very hard to see. This is a um, spider mite on the upper right-hand side, magnified. They are, um, um, they are related to spiders, they're arachnids. Um, Insects have six legs, arachnids, spiders, and mites have eight legs. So that's one of the ways you tell them. But with spider mites, the telltale sign is this very fine webbing that a lot of times you'll find. Um, this is a, a very um, common symptom. This is a, a feeding damage from spider mites on a, a, on a white spruce. Um, this is the damage that's done on deciduous leaves. Um, it's sort of a dis discoloration of the leaves. Uh, oftentimes you'll find the spider mites on the undersides of the leaves. Again, they're sap sucking um, mites. Let's quickly go through some diseases. Anthracnose, which is really a term that we use to describe a lot of um, fungal infections. Um, Sycamores, London plane trees, if you ever wonder why they tend to lose their leaves in the summer or their leaves seem to fall prolifically. Uh, sometimes it's an infestation of um, sycamore or London plane tree anthracnose. These are the patches that they make on the leaves, but it also attacks the stem. So when the infection gets into the stem, um, the leaves often fall in the summer. Um, very hard to control, timing is very critical for fungicides. Um, it runs in cycles. You really need to have a wet, uh, rainy weather event during the spring when the leaves are forming for it to um, take hold. Um, I think every year we see, you know, some 
if not uh, a lot of uh, anthracnose. Dogwoods and uh, anthracnose on dogwoods is a very common problem. Again, these brown patches uh, thinning out. This is the, um, the, the symptom of um, dogwood anthracnose. It makes the tree decline in health. Other problems come in, so it weakens the trees. If you see uh, any kind of um, mushrooms or any kind of fungal growth, um, around the base of trees, especially oak trees, or malaria root rot is uh, probably what's going on. Uh, this can be a sign that um, there's a lot more going on um, in the um, root system and at the base of the trunk, um, something to be aware of and have um, looked at by professionals. There's all kinds of blights out there. Um, these are just some of them. Um, juniper, if you ever wondered why you get these little tip uh, browning on it, it could be cabotina. Uh, lots of Leyland cypress out there. They do get this ceridium canker, which is an infection of the um, stem uh, at the base of this brown. Um, sometimes it's hard to see, but sometimes you'll find a swelling. Uh, ceridium canker is, um, common on Leylands that are um, stressed, drought stricken. Um, sometimes the larger ones um, commonly get this because rainfall is lacking and sometimes the irrigation system isn't enough to keep them well hydrated. Fire blight on pear, um, again, the, a lot of ornamental pears around. Uh, I've you know, seen this on uh, some of those. Uh, again, it's an infection of the stem. And then uh, needle blights and needle casts, um, all kinds of, um, cause all kinds of problems on the spruces, uh, Norway spruce, uh, the uh, Colorado blue spruce on the left there. It just devastates the um, foliage. Um, Rhizos farrier is pretty common. Um, typically it works its way from the bottom upward into the tree. Um, but there's uh, all kinds of uh, needle cast. This is an arborvitae with a type of needle cast on it as well. Um, problems on the stems and twigs. Uh, these are just some of them, but they cause these strange growths um, like the nectria canker on, uh, that's a uh, ornamental cherry, uh, nectria galls, that was on an oak. Um, the uh, Phomopsis cankers are forming here on a, um, oh, a cottonwood tree. Black knot is a weird thing that uh, often uh, people bring into me. It's an infection of the, of the branches. Um, the only thing that you can do for it is really prune it out, not much more that you can do. And then trees develop these uh, what we call burls. Um, you know, we don't often know exactly what the cause of it is, but oftentimes it's from a, a bacterial or a fungal infection um, that um, the tree tries to respond to by um, growing around it and uh, this burl forms. A lot of times the trees live for a long time uh, with these burls. There's really not much you can do, but um, just know what, um, what it is and what the cause of it is. And then there are spots on the leaves. This uh, particular group is called uh, rusts. They're um, um, the cedar apple rust and the pear juniper rust. They need two species. So uh, the, juniper, the uh, pear rust forms leaf, uh, spots on the leaves of the ornamental as well as the fruit bearing pears in the um, summer. Um, the, uh, the little uh, yellow spots, if you turn the leaf on, upside down, you, you'll see these bumps. The spores are emitted. They land on the twigs of junipers, which is the alternate host species, and they infect the twigs and the stems. And then in the spring, they erupt and release spores. In the spring, about the time when the pear leaves are forming again, so it needs these two host species to exist simultaneously. Same thing with cedar apple rust. Again, cedars or junipers. Um, this is it, the spots that they make on members of the apple family, which include the crab apple, um, the uh, shad bush, um, 
or service berry. Um, these are the weird um, structures that are formed in the spring on the junipers that emit the spores. So it spends the summer on the members of the apple family and it spends the winter um, as an infection on the twigs of the junipers. Leaf spots, there's all different kinds of leaf spots. This is a uh, cherry shot hole leaf spot disease. It causes holes in the members of the cherry family. So it's an infection. Um, it's actually a description that we use for um, bacterial and fungal infections that cause this kind of symptoms. Usually it starts off as a small leaf spot. And then as the spot grows, the tissue uh, falls out in the middle of the circular spot, rendering a hole uh, on the bottom here. This is it on cherry laurels. There are leaf spots that form on oak trees like this tobacco oak leaf spot, maple tar spot. Some years are worse than others because a lot of these are triggered by wet, rainy conditions in the spring. Verticillium wilt is a problem uh, that's not uncommon on Long Island. It's uh, often um, attacks maples. Um, it's a vascular system disease. It kind of, it's soil borne, so it enters through the root system. Here's a tree that's showing signs of it where one section of the tree is obviously infected. Um, this is what it does to the, um, the leaves. It cuts off the um, sap from getting to the leaves. So it causes, you know, scorching. Uh, sometimes you can tell that you have it if you cut a uh, twig and if you see this darkened area uh, inside the twig, that indicates that perhaps it's um, verticillium. You know, we'll, we'll cover some of the uh, other problems, salt damage. We did see a lot of this on our trees after the summer storms, uh, um, especially storms that track in over the ocean, pick up salt in the uh, mist. So it uh, salts a dehydrator, so it causes the uh, scorching on the leaves. This is on the right here are white pines. They're very susceptible to salt damage, but this could be either uh, salt from storms or it could be uh, salt from uh, road salt that's being kicked up uh, and blown onto the uh, white pines. So salt is uh, uh, very damaging a lot of times. And then we have woodpeckers. A lot of times I do get questions about, you know, these holes that line up in a row. Uh, no insect really does that. They're not that organized. But these woodpeckers, uh, which are saps, the sap suckers are especially known to create these uh, lines of holes. Um, it's the yellow, yellow bellied sap sucker. Um, they make a hole or what they call a well or a sap well, and the sap leaks into the well and they drink the sap. Woodpeckers do look for uh, insects and feed on borers and such, but their damage is more random when they're looking for insects. So woodpeckers can be helpful in a way for trees and eradicating some of the you know, borer problems. Uh, this is a um, ash tree that has an infection of, is infested with emerald ash borer and the woodpeckers have been stripping the bark off of it, looking for um, the borers to eat. Sometimes we have problems where, um, you know, the place that we plant trees is not really ideal. So sometimes there's a limited planting space, like in the upper left-hand corner here. Um, not much space here, but also there may be something else going on uh, because the trunk is very straight and there's no root flare. And uh, that may indicate that there's uh, a lot of uh, roots that are maybe girdling. Um, the development of the root flare. Um, large trees can get blown over when there's compacted soil uh, where roots can't grow on the curbside and under the roadway. That makes them um, a greater risk for being blown over by windstorms. On the bottom here are girdling roots, but this picture on the top here um, shows you how it may be that the girdling roots were a result of planting a tree that was pot bound and didn't um, address the um, roots that were um, starting to grow around the uh, container. 
soil compaction. This is a pin oak tree that was doing quite well. Uh, and then somebody in a lawn, somebody decided to change the landscape here and put in uh, pavers. And that kind of changed the whole site condition there. And it made the soil compacted and um, the tree suffering because of it. So soil compaction um, alone from construction or from equipment or pedestrians walking on it can impact tree roots. Um, when the tree was planted years ago, it was a nice location for it because it was nothing but a nice lawn there in that situation. Nutrient deficiencies can show up as discoloration on the leaves. Um, sometimes it's a deficiency of an actual nutrient like this manganese on the right or iron deficiency on this oak here. Um, a lab analysis is really uh, one way that you can tell. You, they can do an uh, analysis on the uh, leaf tissue or on the soil. Um, in this situation here, this um, maple tree, um, the deficiency was actually, was an iron deficiency that was being caused by a very high pH. Apparently the uh, folks taking care of the lawn here were very um, good at uh, applying lime every year and it raised the pH. Um, way above where it should have been. It was uh, higher than 8.0. So you got to look for these. Uh, so putting more iron would not have corrected this. Changing the pH would have made the iron more available that was naturally occurring in the soil and would have corrected this. And then there's seasonal shedding of uh, trees, the conifers. Um, Dawn redwood and bald cypress on the top are actually deciduous. Conifers, they lose their leaves every year. I do get people uh, asking me and bringing me in samples this time of year, asking me what killed their um, trees. Um, but it's, uh, it's normal for them to lose their leaves and they put out nice new green leaves in the spring. Um, white pine, Leyland cypress, a lot of the conifers, as you can see here, lose their older foliage. Um, they retain their newer foliage, this happens pretty much every year where the oldest foliage is cast off um, in preparation for um, winter, less um, resources needed to keep it on there. As new growth comes out on the terminal ends of these plants, the older foliage is no longer functioning, it's shaded, it um, is cast off, so that's normal. And then last but not least, uh, I get a lot of questions about lichen, this uh, weird uh, disease that's growing on my tree and causing it to die. Lichen is there because the um, lichen is um, an organism. It's a combination of um, algae and uh, fungus, um, different types. There's many different types of these combinations. Um, it, it needs um, a surface that, it, contains moisture in order to thrive. Um, when moisture is lacking, it kind of shrinks away and dis almost looks like it disappears. But when moisture is abundant, they kind of bloom. Um, they're not parasites. Um, they're not feeding on the tree or making the tree decline. But one of the things that I've noticed over the years that those trees and shrubs that have a lot of lichen on it may be suffering from some other problems. So you got to look closer. Maybe they have um, scale or some other uh, insect problem because uh, those trees and shrubs that are in a slow decline and aren't growing uh, as aggressively as they used to um, are typically the trees that and shrubs that lichen tends to do um, much more um, prolifically growing on. Um, so. Um, when, even though I explain that this is not a parasite on the tree and it's not causing the decline, let's look at, you know, the tree more closely for other problems that are out there. And that concludes um, my little whirlwind tour of common tree problems that um, I thought I would share with you. So Michael, uh, do we have any um, questions? Thank you, Vinny. We do have a couple of questions for you. Um, some of these you might have answered already, but I'll just go through the list. Um, the first one is, do any 
aldegids feed on white pines? Yeah, um, white pine, uh, pine bark uh, adelgid is um, a common problem on white pine. So white pine has a very thin bark. And so, yeah, you will find that on there. Although you will find, um, because it's thin bark, sometimes the sap leaks out. So you have to, you know, um, take a really close look. And if you're not sure, get, get help from somebody like us at Cooperative Extension. So a lot of the conifers uh, that are thin bark do leak sap. All right, uh, next question is, does the chestnut borer feed on the horse chestnuts? Not that I know of, but that's only because I don't see a lot of horse chestnuts around typically, and I don't get a lot of questions about them. But I do know that um, oaks, if, if you do have a problem with your horse chestnut, it, it may be something else, but it's worth looking into. One more question. Do arborvitae trees support wildlife? Uh, they do. Um, they provide uh, protective cover. Uh, they provide um, food. Um, they do produce seed. So um, between cover for um, escaping predators, nesting, um, and the like, um, I think arborvitae serve a you know, ecological purpose. One more question. What is crepe murder? Crepe murder? I don't know. What is it? Is, uh, maybe it's crepe myrtle? Crepe myrtle oh, is yeah. a type of tree? Well, if anyone has any uh, additional questions to clarify that, you guys can feel free to send us an email. Um, but it looks like that is yeah, my questions we have right now. Um, but just as a reminder to everyone, um, some people are doing it already. If you would like to receive ISA CEU credits for your attendance, please submit your full name and your ISA certification number into the chat function. So I put up the page with all the contact information as well. And Michael, this will be up on our website in a couple of days. Yes, all of our web uh, webinars are recorded and they will be available on our website under the virtual learning section. One more question we have, how are the hemlocks doing with the woolly al alligator? Well, you don't see a lot of hemlocks um, around uh, as much as you used to. And I'm talking like 40 years ago, it was probably the number one. It was, our, it was actually the arborvitae of 40 years ago. Everybody had a hemlock hedge. Now you hardly ever see them because um, they were, you know, either, either folks didn't know that they had this problem and they actually hemlocks have several other problems they do get. Uh, hem elongated hemlock scale, um, sp spruce spider mites love them as well. So they really had a lot of things not going in their um, favor. And that required to keep them healthy and vigorously growing, that required them to be um, treated with um, pesticides. Um, even though um, a lot of times what would have um, controlled all of those pests were very safe, like horticultural oils. Um, I think people just got kind of tired of spraying the hemlocks all the time. And so arborvitae became the, the new uh, hemlock and that's why you see so many arborvitaes. But, you know, whenever you plant a lot of one particular species everywhere, you're creating what's called a monoculture. And when you get a particular um, pest problem or two or five, um, they do very well and they spread like a wildfire. So um, it's always good to mix up the species and the genuses. Um, even on a, 
you've been on a home property, um, but you know, maybe that's a talk for another time. Um, but that's why you don't see a lot of hemlocks around anymore. Now, there are some natural predators that uh, are being introduced um, actually by Cornell University, um, predator, insect predators that feed on it. I don't remember the names of them, um, but they're in the research stage and um, they're releasing them. And uh, they're predators, they're insect predators that feed on the hemlock oleodelgids that um, are from uh, Asia, Asia and keep the uh, adelgid um, populations, you know, more in balance over there. So they they are working on these um, natural predators to come in, and uh, who knows? Maybe one day we'll see um, hemlocks again. Um, and, you know, it's it's rare that you see a large old hemlock in in natural areas, but once in a while I'm out and about in a wooded area where not much has been going on uh, away from, you know, uh, cult cultivated landscapes. And I do see some big old hemlocks every once in a while. So um, something must be uh, keeping the hemlock woolly adelgid at bay um, there. So who knows, but that's the way the, wor you know, the natural world is, you know, like I don't see as much problem anymore with the, uh, gypsy moth, I see little outbreaks of it, like, you know, here and there across the, you know, Long Island landscape, but I don't see the devastation that, that I saw when I was a young man, um, you know, where the gypsy moth came in and wiped out, you know, acres and acres of, um, you know, our um, native oaks. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, more than once in a season. So, and I, you know, it was so bad a lot of times, I remember seeing uh, the gypsy moth feeding on some of the conifers uh, because there was nothing else left for them to eat. So, which was unusual, but you know, these uh, fungal and virus diseases must have um, kind of got that under control um, to a large extent. So now you see these little outbreaks, but not as much significant, you know, acreage being damaged, but leave things alone, I guess nature comes in and, you know, balances things out. So. Okay, so any more questions? That seems to be the last of our questions right now. If anyone has any questions after the webinar, um, you can contact Vinny with the contact information up on the screen, or you can send us an email at nasa at cornell.edu. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Vinny, for your, you know, your excellent presentation. Um, just as a reminder, there will not be a webinar next week. Um, hopefully everyone enjoys their Thanksgiving. We will be resuming with the webinars on November 30th. So we hope to see you all then. Have a great night. Very good. Thank you, Michael. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Be safe.